Welcome to Train Signal. You're watching Video 3, Part 1, Configuring Outlook 2003. In this video, we're going to focus in real heavily on the client side of this whole email equation, and that's Outlook 2003. Now, this is real important because Outlook 2003 can be just as confusing sometimes as Exchange 2003. So we've divided this video up into two different parts. You're currently watching part one, and we'll follow that up immediately with part two in a different video. In part one, we're going to go over several different topics, starting off first with your different email options or choices that you have when it comes to setting up email for your organization. From there, we're going to take a look at the popular POP3 configuration, just go through that relatively quickly and give you some ins and outs of this particular setup. From there, we're going to look at PST file settings, different things you can do with the PST file, the advantages and disadvantages of PST files, and we're going to go into backing up Outlook. This is real important, especially when you're dealing with PST files. These can become corrupted relatively easily, and if you don't have a current backup, you've lost that email. After that, we're going to get into the Exchange server itself. So we're going to set up this Exchange server mailbox and then import our actual PST file into the mailbox. From there, we'll do some basic emailing, set up the global address list, and take a look at how that works before we advance into the more detailed topics in Part 2. Okay, let's take a look, quick look here at our different email options. And, you know, you're, of course, familiar with probably at least some of these. So, of course, we have web-based email, and that would be Hotmail or Yahoo out there. And uh, advantages there, free or cheap, easy to set up, accessible from public computers. Um, downsides, well, they're not as professional as your own domain name. Not available offline, so that's one thing that's nice about POP3 or Exchange Server if you have it done in certain configurations. You can access your email when you're not connected to the network or the internet. Okay, and you also are very restricted and limited by whatever Hotmail, Yahoo, or you know whatever you're getting your web-based email from, whatever they want. Okay, and when we, when we talk about that, we're dealing with what you can send, how much space you have, those sorts of things. Now, POP3, which we're going to be focusing on uh, predominantly in this video, real cheap and easy to set up and the email is basically downloaded from the ISP server to your local computer okay and the nice thing about it you have to connect to get your email but once you have it downloaded to your local computer you then don't have to be connected to the network anymore and you can view and compose email while you're offline some problems with it well it's not very secure that's one issue uh, your username and password are typically sent across the network in clear text, so this can be stolen by anybody out there on the Internet. And you're still restricted and have limitations. You know, when we talked about that before, well, when you have a POP3 account, typically, not always because we can set this up in an Exchange server, but typically you can have a POP3 account with an ISP, okay, and this ISP is going to... Uh, restrict you as far as the size of your mailbox, size of your messages, uh, how many email accounts you can have, so on and so forth. IMAP4 is another alternative similar to POP3, uh, fairly cheap, easy to set up. Problem with it, it's not really offered by all ISPs. You don't have the choice of using IMAP4 in most cases. Um, email is stored on the mail server similar to Exchange. This is an advantage to IMAP4, but the message headers can be read offline. Okay, so you kind of get the best of both worlds, and in the future, IMAP4 is probably going to replace POP3, uh, but currently POP3 still has a much larger market share. Lastly, IMAP4 is more secure than POP3, so if security is an important concept to you, and of course it should be, then IMAP4 might be a better choice for you as well. Okay, and lastly, what we're going to be focusing on for the rest of this course, Exchange Server, basically hosting your own mail server, okay? What are the advantages and disadvantages? Well, first off, it's expensive to install and maintain. You're talking about her, uh, server hardware, server software, antivirus software, any sorts of uh, spam prevention, Trojan horse prevention. Um, you need somebody who knows how to manage it. Okay, so hosting your own mail server definitely is not a cheap uh, option. Okay, what do we do with it? Well, mail is stored on the server which basically provides us with centralized backups and all sorts of other great features. It's very flexible, lots of options. It does include a web-based client, Outlook Web Access, so that kind of gives us the uh, best of both worlds that we see up here with our web-based email, so we can ac have access to this Exchange server from anywhere in the world. Okay, and it's also not just email. You're going to see throughout this course, we're going to go into a lot of the different features of Exchange 2003, and you're going to see you can do a lot more with it than just the messaging that everybody knows it for. Okay, let's get started. 
first thing we're going to do is connect on over to XP1 and talk about what we can do with the POP3 configuration. Okay, so we're going to connect over to XP1 using a remote desktop connection. And we're going to log on here as Bob Bass, a user in the Sophie's Toy Box network. Okay, so what we're going to do is just open up Outlook. And this is the first time that Bob Bass has opened up Outlook on this system. So you get this installation here. Office is actually already installed. But this is kind of like a custom installation. This is going to happen for each individual user when they log on. And this is setting up uh, profile information, getting some user-specific data set up for each different user account. Okay, so should open up our Outlook 2003 startup wizard here in a second. Okay, yep, that's what we get, Outlook 2003 startup. So when we click Next here, we have the choice of creating an email account, and we do want to create one, so we'll leave Yes and click Next. And now we have several different types, server types they list, for our email accounts. Now, we're going to be using Exchange Server quite a bit throughout this course. Uh, normally, that's what we'll select. In this case, we're going to select POP3, because that's what we're working on right now. But you also have the options to set up an IMAP email account, a web-based HTTP email account, such as Hotmail, or other third-party servers as well. So we're going to leave POP3, click Next, and now we get to fill in the information for our POP3 settings. And this is going to be common with any of your POP3 accounts that you might set up. This is provided, for the most part, from your ISP. Uh, use uh, your name and email address. This is going to be somewhat provided by yourself. So, for example... Bob Bass might just put his name in here. This is what's going to appear in the from line whenever he sends an email. Then we'll go down to email address, and Bob Bass's email for this particular example is just bobbass at trainsignal.com. Okay, so we just set up a uh, email account on a third-party POP3 account through Yahoo. Okay, so we just set up this account to demonstrate this for you. Okay, the POP settings through Yahoo, and these were provided by the uh, ISP pop.bizmail.yahoo.com so they have a pop3 server that resolves to this fully qualified domain name okay and then their SMT, SMTP server their outgoing mail server resolves to this fully qualified domain name now careful on this username setting this uh, has gotten people quite a bit but typically you're going to have an email address here and not just the username as you see. So in this case, it's going to be Bob Bass at trainsignal.com and then the password that's been set up for Bob Bass's user account as well. Now, this is up to you whether or not you want to remember the password. Um, it's a heck of a lot easier so you don't have to put this in every single time your email client goes out to access email, but it's also a little bit less secure. Anybody can walk up, open up Outlook, um, and then they'd be able to check your email. Okay, if we go down here to more settings, we do have several other settings that we can set as well. Um, here, this is just for your own purposes. So we might call this uh, Bob's Pop3 account. Nobody else is going to see this. Uh, this is optional information, but you can set up a reply, email, or organization to go along with your email address. Um, this is becoming more and more common these days to prevent what's called SMTP relaying. Okay, and this is the practice that spammers typically use, uh, basically using live SMTP servers out there on the Internet, forwarding their spam through those servers, and then taking advantage of that free relay out to all the different people who receive their email. Okay, and what ends up happening then is the ISP or whoever op left that open relay, they're actually blamed for the spam that's coming to them. So what we have to do for this particular account is actually authenticate to the SMTP server. So I need to select this. This is going to require a username and password. You have two different options here. You can either use the same settings as the incoming mail server, or you can log on using a different username and password. Okay, now this is set by our ISP. In this particular case, we're using the same settings as the incoming mail server. Okay, so we're going to click on connection just to show you that you can connect different ways. If you have a uh, uh, dial up, be using a phone line or some sort of third party dialer. Okay, in our case, we're connecting over a local area network. And then we have our advanced tab here. Uh, typically, you're going to be leaving these server port numbers alone. POP3 defaults to 110. If you are using Secure Sockets Layer, this would be set up again uh, on the ISP side. Then you can check this box and it actually change this number for you to 995. 
Same thing for SMTP. By default, we're using port 25. If you select this, it stays at 25, but you have the ability to change this port to anything that you want. Okay, another option that's important, especially in a situation uh, like this. Uh, if you're accessing your Exchange server uh, mailbox, and you can set up POP3 to access email off of your Exchange server, uh, in that case, you may want to leave copies of the messages on the server, so eventually they'll still be within your Exchange server mailbox. And what this basically does, no matter how you set this up, it's going to allow you to download your email into your POP3 client, and it's going to leave this email on the server. So the next time you go back and you actually download email again, if you go from a different computer, it's actually going to download this email uh, all over again. Okay, and then you have a couple options down here. You can remove the email from the server after a specified amount of time, or you can move it from the server when you delete it from the deleted items folder. Okay, so both of these can help you control that actual email. We're going to leave this unselected right now, and we'll just go ahead and click OK here, and then we can click Test Account Settings to make sure we have everything set up correctly here. So it takes just a little bit of time. You can see we got uh, green check marks all the way down. So this is set up good here. OK, next, we're just going to click Next and then Finish. And now we've got our POP3 email account all set up. OK, right off the bat, let's take a look at a couple things we can do to kind of spruce this up a little bit. And we've got this all crushed together because the screen resolution is so low for this particular video recording. But you can change things pretty easily with an Outlook by going up top to View. You can change the reading pane where it displays. I'm going to put it on the bottom here. And then you can use your slider bars and kind of slide things around to uh, you know, make it meet your particular requirements. Now one thing I do like to see here, instead of having this as a folder list, especially when we're demonstrating Exchange Server. So I select this button here and now I've got a folder list that's going to display my inbox, my calendar, my contacts, all that good stuff. Now, one other setting I like to take care of anytime I'm setting up a POP3 account, I like to have it check that server pretty often. And right now you can see no email has actually come through except for this default Outlook email that's sent anytime you set up Outlook for the first time. What you can do right away is go up to Tools, then go to Options, and you have quite a few different settings that you can go through. Now one setting that I like to take a look at right away is your mail setup and then within send receive you can actually control how often this client machine is going to go out talk to the pop server and try to download new email okay so definitely want to include this group in any send receives that we do and I also want to schedule an automatic send receive I like to move this down as low as possible even to one minute okay you may want to do this that's up to you I'm gonna leave that off for right now though uh, basically you know doing a send receive every time you exit Outlook Okay, so I've got that selected. I just need to click Close here. Now, if I click OK again, every minute now, Outlook's going to go out to the POP3 server and then download email. So we're going to let that kind of run by itself, um, and we'll see here within a minute or so we should get a couple emails. Now, a couple other things we can look at here, uh, some other options that I think are important and you may want to take a look at. We're going to go right back into those options once again. Then we're going to go to the Preferences tab, as you see right here. Now we're going to go to Email Options in this Advanced Email Options button. Now, kind of some cool things you can see here. Auto save any email messages that you've started to put together. So in case something happens, computer crashes, you accidentally close, um, you'll auto save these messages every three minutes. Where you want to save these messages to, uh, different things to do when your uh, new email arrives. Desktop alert settings, this is something that's new to Exchange 2003 but you can actually control the little icon that appears um, and just by sliding this bar one way or another you can have it appear for shorter or for longer or you can determine whether or not it's transparent uh, if you can see it or not how transparent it should actually be now when I click preview it actually shows it to me you're not going to actually see this because when we go through this, it's not shown up in the video. Okay, so you may not see the uh, transparent messages that come up right here, but right now it's displaying this and it's actually showing just a preview of this and at the same time the new messages have come through that we uh, downloaded from the POP3 server. So I'm going to go ahead and close this and then take a look. We see that we did get a couple messages here. Uh, these are addressed to Bob Bass, a couple test messages, and then also sent earlier we have 
meeting requests and also a uh, thanks for choosing SAS Technology Advisors. So a couple email messages that were sent earlier on. So fairly simple to set up POP3 to check email like that. Some other things you may want to take a look at if you go back into uh, the options. This junk mail box, this is new in Outlook 2003. This does a pretty good job of filtering out junk email. Especially, make sure you download the service pack. There's a uh, actually a post service pack one fix for Outlook 2003 that really does a much better job of filtering this junk mail. Um, in the initial version of Office 2003, I felt like it did pick up quite a few legitimate email and threw, uh, threw it into the junk mail folder. Um, now with this new post service pack fix, I found that it does a much better job. So take a look at this. Um, you got a lot of control here. Uh, how Basically, you can choose how much protection you want. You can put no filtering, low filtering, high filtering. You've got safe sender lists. If you know that you get email from certain people, for example, you could add train signal to your safe senders list, safe recipients, okay, blocked senders, all sorts of stuff. Okay, so take a look at the junk mail. Definitely a great new feature in Outlook 2003. One last thing I'll point out to you within these options is over here and this is the auto archive options uh, auto, ar auto archive can really help you out with Outlook because right now what's gonna we're gonna talk more about this next but when you're using Outlook it creates what's called a PST file okay and a PST file can really grow in size and this PST file is stored on your local system okay and as it grows and becomes larger and larger it becomes a lot more difficult to deal with okay this file can become corrupt um, in previous versions of Outlook before 2003, if this file reaches 2 gigabytes, it actually freezes up and you can't access that PST file at all. Now, Outlook 2003 has changed this. You can get a much larger PST file, somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 gigabytes, which is a gigantic file. Um, but Auto, Auto Archive can really help you out in managing your mailbox. Okay, if you click this, what this is going to do for you is basically set up auto archive to run and every 14 days by default it's going to run and it's going to clean out items older than six months by default okay and you can set it on any folders that you like so for example if uh, your deleted items you only want to keep two months worth of deleted items you can have it run on your deleted items and basically take all that information out of there and keep your PST file smaller okay and that's important not only for uh, to avoid corruption, but it's also important because when you go through and you're actually accessing Outlook, it gets slow. If you open up deleted items, for example, and you have a lot of deleted items here, it can take quite a long time just to even open that up and display the messages within your deleted items section. Okay, when you close Outlook and open Outlook back up, it's going to take longer to actually open and close and you run into a lot more problems. You'll, you'll notice that uh, you get uh, messages saying that Outlook wasn't configured properly or wasn't closed properly. Okay, If you're backing up your Outlook PST file, it can take a significant amount of time uh, the larger your file is. Uh, it was typically for a while when I was using PST files, working with a file that was roughly 500 to 750 megabytes in size, and you're talking about a half an hour backup or so just to back that file up. Okay, so something that you want to avoid try to make that file as small as possible okay let's talk about that PST file a little bit more and what we're gonna do here to get to the PST file you can actually right click personal folders go down to properties okay and this folder size here starts to tell you a little bit about the size of the PST file and it breaks it down by each of the individual subfolders and the total size here or you can go over to advanced Okay, and then it gives you even more information. Here's the file name. If you go out here, it gives you the exact location of the file, how, what type of encryption you're using. You can set a password on this file. Okay, and if you set this password up, what it basically does is it prompts you for a password every time you open up Outlook. Okay, so that's another option that you can exercise as well. If your file is becoming large in size, you can actually compact the file to reduce the size of it and make your Outlook run more efficiently. Okay, so you have several different pieces that you can run on the actual personal, uh, personal store file itself. I'm going to go back up here into Options again, and what I want to look at, I'm going to actually pull up that uh, file. So if we come here to Mail Setup, and then we go into Data Files, here we see the actual personal folder, the data file that we're working with, 
And if we click here on settings, oops, same information. Let's go over here to uh, open folder. This actually takes us out to the location of this PST file. And I think this is important to point out to you because this PST file, uh, you can really just pick up this PST file, set it down anywhere, and you can open it up and basically uh, use Outlook to open this PST file up on other systems. Okay, so if you wanted to restore Outlook or make a backup of Outlook, it's pretty simple to actually go through and do that. Okay, and we're going to go through that here in just a second, how to actually back up Outlook. Okay, so the PST file you see is located within the documents and settings, within the user's profile name, then within the local settings directory, application data, Microsoft, Outlook. So it's kind of buried deep within the uh, directory structure there, so it can be difficult to find at times. Let's take a look at what we would do, want to do if we wanted to back this file up. Okay, and I think it's important, this should happen pretty frequently if you're using personal uh, PST files. Just go to File, Import and Export, and you're going to export it to a file. From there you click Next, PST, okay, and then select the folder to export from. You're going to select this top level folder, although if you didn't want to um, export the entire thing, you could select just one individual piece here. So we are going to uh, back up the entire thing or export the entire thing. And we also want to cl uh, click this box down below to include subfolders. Now you can also go into this filter. Maybe you want to back up everything, but you only want to back up everything that's uh, within the last three months. You can set that filter to include options such as those as well. So we're going to leave the default settings here, the whole folder, subfolders, and then we'll click Next. Now we get to choose the location to export it to. And we're just going to throw this onto the desktop so it's nice and easy to find. And we'll leave it named Backup as well. So I click OK. Uh, replace duplicates with items exported. Well, we're not really exporting this into another file, so this isn't going to make a difference right here. So we'll leave this selection, click Finish. And now our last option here, we have the choice of renaming this file. We can, we can choose a different encryption setting. You see by default we have Compressible Encryption. We can have no encryption if we don't want to use that, or we can have high encryption. Um, ramifications of using the highest encryption is just going to take longer to actually um, create this file. If you want to set a password, which is a good idea, you can put a password on this PST file. Then if anybody finds this file on the network, or maybe you burn it to a CD and then lose the CD, they wouldn't be able to open this PST file up unless they had the password. Now the downside, if you forget your password here, keep in mind this is not a domain password. This is just a local password. So if you or your users are using Outlook and they want to put a password on this PST file, you've got to be real careful because by default you're not going to be able to walk over to their system, throw in a password, and access this for them. Okay? Nor will you be able to reset their password from the domain level. Okay? If you search on the Internet, though, you will find password recovery tools for Outlook, so you'd have to go down that particular path. Okay, We're going to click OK here. And because this is so small, we really only have four messages here, the PST file has already been created. Okay, so if we take a look, you know, this file is only 265 kilobytes in size, so very, very small PST file here. Okay, we're now going to take a look at how we can convert our PST file forward into an Exchange server mailbox. So picture this as a scenario. Maybe Bob Bass has been using his uh, POP3 account for quite a long time. You know, Sophie's Toy Box company is just upgrading to Exchange right now. So he probably has a ton of email inside his PST file, uh, saved information, calendaring information, all sorts of stuff. So when you set up an Exchange server mailbox, if you just set it up from scratch, you're going to lose all that information. And that's, you know, just not acceptable to Bob Bass. So what we're going to do here now, we're going to take this information that we exported, and you know, you're going to have to pretend here a little bit because we only have four different pieces in that inbox, so this is just going to be representative of all of Bob Bass's information. But what we're going to do is we're going to take that information and we're going to import it into his Exchange Server Mailbox. Okay, so to do that, we got to set up an Exchange Server Mailbox first. So let's go ahead and close Outlook right now. Okay, and what we need to do is go into Start, Control Panel, and we're going to go to this Mail icon. Okay, and, and actually I, want to, I do want to show you one thing within Outlook real quick here. So let's go back here just momentarily. What you might want to do, what you could try doing, is going up here to Tools, then going to Email Accounts, 
okay, and then adding a new email account, okay, and this is perfectly acceptable. In most cases, let's say this was an exchange mailbox, you could do this and you could add yourself a new POP3 email account within here. Well, if I click Next and then I choose Microsoft Exchange Server, okay, I get the message here that you cannot add an exchange account to this profile while Outlook is running. Okay, and it references to that mail icon that we were just looking at a second ago. So that's why I closed this a second ago here. And we're going up to control panel and then going into the mail icon here. Okay, from this mail icon, we're going to go to email accounts. Okay, and now we're basically going through that exact same wizard. We're going to add a new email account. And now we're going to choose Microsoft Exchange Server. And this time it actually lets us get past that particular piece. So we're connecting to Exchange 1, the name of the server, and we're going to be using Cached Exchange Mode, great new feature in Exchange 2003. This basically provides you cached information from your Exchange server, even if you're not connected, even if you have a laptop or you're not in the office, you actually are still going to be able to access this cached information, your calendar items, inbox, things along those lines. Now, of course, you're not going to have access to new email, okay, or new information that's been added to your calendar by somebody else, but you're going to have this information. You can actually uh, work offline, compose email. When you connect back again to your Exchange server, at that point, it's going to connect you and send all this email back through the Exchange server uh, out over the Internet. Okay, the username is Bob Bass. I'm just going to put in B Bass here. Click Check Name. Okay, and it's now connecting out, and you see that it, it's going to be successful. It gives you these underlined um, names here. So you see we have Exchange 1 and Bob Bass. We're then going to click Next. Okay, and this is a warning. It's letting us know that, you know, normally Exchange Server is going to deliver mail, um, and it's going to be stored on the server. In this case, because of the way we have this set up, all of our Exchange emails is actually going to be loaded still locally in a PST file. Okay, and this is how we have to do it initially. We'll change this in a second, but make sure you change this. Okay, when we're using Exchange, the last thing we want to be doing is have an Exchange email account and then have all of our email delivered to a local PST account. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and open up Exchange now, or Outlook now. Okay, and now right now, like, like it told us before, we still are directing all this email to a PST file. Okay, so if we look, we got a couple things going here. Number one, we do have a mailbox, Bob Bass. This is our exchange mailbox that we see down here. Okay, and it looks identical pretty much to our, our uh, PST file that we have above, the personal folders. So I'm going to close this and close both of these just so we can see both of these right next to each other. Now what we're going to do next, we're going to set this up like we were just talking about a second ago, and we're going to make it so the mailbox is actually storing all the email and data on the server instead of bringing it local into that PST file. So to do this, we need to go into Tools, Email Accounts, and we're going to go to View or Change Existing Email Accounts. Okay, so I'm going to select Microsoft Exchange Server, and it tells us right here that new email is delivered to the following location. We're going to switch that up, okay, and then specify that it's delivered to the mailbox. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead then and click Finish here. We are warned you have changed the default delivery location, so we got to restart Outlook. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay, and now that I've restarted Outlook, we see that here's my mailbox up here. Okay, it's actually put this above the personal folders, but the problem we have now, <clears throat> we have two different locations. And, you know, keep in mind, we're migrating forward. Bob Bass is going to be using this Exchange server exclusively. So there's no reason we really want to have a personal folder here where we have some of our information stored locally, and then we have our mailbox here with none of our information in it or just the new information. So what we're going to do is take that backup that we created before and import that into our mailbox. Okay, so to do this, let's first select our mailbox. Then we're going to go up here to File, Import, and we're going to import from another program or file. So I click Next. I'm going to go down here to Personal Folder File, PST, and now I have to browse to our backup. Okay, and remember we save this on the desktop. Here's the backup, and you know in our hypothetical situation we we're talking about thousands of emails, all sorts of old data that we're bringing into our Exchange server. So this can take quite a long time if we're talking about that much data. Okay, select the folder to import from. I'm going to select this one, include all the subfolders, and then where do I want to import it into? Uh, import items into the same folders, okay, so it's going to replicate where all this information is into the mailbox 
dash Bob Bass. So that's Bob Bass's exchange mailbox. So now I click finish. Okay, and like I said, there's not much data, so it was pretty quick. Notice now that I've got all of this email has been brought forward into the Exchange mailbox. Okay, so pretty cool. Now we have all that information into Exchange. Going forward, any email that Bob gets, it's going to be put automatically into his mailbox. Okay, now down here, we still have that personal folder. So we can do a couple things with this. It's kind of irrelevant right now. It's not being used anymore because we're going to get rid of our POP email account. So one thing we could do, we could just close this out if we just don't want to see it. Maybe it's clouding up our view of Outlook and we just don't want to see it right now, so we just click, click Close. So it's no longer there. It's not deleted, though. I could always open it back up again if I wanted to see it just by coming up here, going to File, Open, and just going to Outlook Data File. Okay. What I'm going to do, though, come up here, go back to Tools, Email Accounts, and we're going to go right back into View or Change Existing Email Accounts. And now you need to make a decision. What do you want to do? Um, you know, with this POP3 account, you could keep this if you're still going to be using it. And maybe you're going through kind of a, a transfer time where for a month or so, you're still going to be using that POP3 email account. Okay, and you're not quite sure if you're going to switch over. But most likely, since we're talking about the exact same email address, we want to, want to get rid of this um, email account. So what I can do is just select it, click Remove, and now I'm going to be deleting this POP3 account. Okay, so we're left with the Exchange Server file, and we can just click Finish. Okay, and now we're left with just our Exchange Server mailbox, and all the old data has been imported from that PST file. Okay, last thing we're going to do here is start sending email back and forth within the Exchange organization. Okay, so we're in Outlook, sending email is pretty straightforward. Okay, and we'll take a look at how we can do this a couple ways. Just click New, and we're going to send a couple emails out. First one's going to be to Frank Bullhead. And now all that I have to do, I can either type out his name completely, I can type in his email address, or I can put in his Exchange alias. And I'll give you a couple examples. If I click Tab here, and we'll just put Test, notice that it automatically populated Frank Bullhead here. I just typed in Frank. What it does, it checks the global address list on Exchange, and it looks to see if there's anybody else who has the name Frank and since there's not it automatically makes the assumption that we're sending this email to Frank <coughs> to Frank Bullhead pardon me you can also put in the uh, alias okay F Bullhead and you see it uh, fills that in for you right away with the display name and of course you can just put in the full email address as well okay no matter which way I slice it, I'm going to go ahead and put that in, and eventually it's going to convert that to my display name like you see here. If you have a question as to what the email address is, you can right-click that, and you can go down to Properties, or you can just double-click it. Okay, and this pulls up the properties of the Frank Bullhead uh, account here. And you see right here, here's the SMTP address, fbullhead at sophiestoybox.local. Okay, fairly straightforward, so I'm just going to go ahead and send this message off to Frank. Okay, it leaves, and just like that, without doing anything else besides what we've done already, we've got our Exchange and Outlook email already working within our network. Okay, one more thing we're going to show you here before we finish up, and that's the global address list. Okay, what the global address list is, is basically um, a list that's used and created from all of the email addresses within our Exchange organization. And if I click 2 here, this is going to pull up all of the email accounts that have been mailbox enabled or mail enabled. Okay, and you don't see all the users in our organization at this point right now because not all of them have been mailbox enabled. So I tell you what we're going to do, just so you get a feel for what this should really look like, I'm going to pause this video momentarily. I'm going to go mailbox enable the other uh, five or ten user accounts or so, and we'll pick right back up from where we left off here. Okay, I took care of that task. So now we're right back in here with the uh, same place we were. I'm going to close this. Just click 2 here again. And now we see uh, about 10 more users or so. Uh, all the users that we set up in the Active Directory users and computers. Okay, so if we want to uh, get more granular with our selections, maybe we have thousands of different user accounts listed here. Instead of looking at the entire global address list, I can go down to uh, just contacts. Okay, and now we see that we have Bob Bass's external account or Troy Trump showing up here. If I want to see users, 
I can just see user accounts, I can see group accounts, and right now we just have the sales group that has a email address associated with it. Okay, so all sorts of different options. We're going to work on address lists a little bit later on in this course, and we'll show you how you can set up additional address lists as well and get more organization with all of our different uh, user accounts that we see here. Okay, so it's real simple. If I want to send an email out, let's say that I'm going to send one to Ray Moray. Just select him, click 2, and then I just have to click OK. Okay, and now it's just a matter of typing out an email. Um, we'll just send out a sales goal email to Ray, click Send, and this email is off and running. Okay, let's go ahead and close this. And just to test, make sure that everything is working correctly, we're going to log off our system here. And we're going to log right back on to XP1 as Frank Bullhead. Okay, and what we'll do here is a couple things. Number one, we're going to see just to make sure that email address came through, and we'll also see how we set up Exchange the very first time when we uh, uh, configure Outlook. Okay, so we log on to XP1. This is the first time that Frank Bullhead has actually logged on to XP1, so it'll take a little bit of time to generate this profile. Then after it's done that, we're just going to go to uh, Start, and we'll open up Microsoft Outlook. Now that's going to open up a wizard that was similar to the one we saw uh, a couple of minutes ago when we set up the POP3 account for Bob Bass. And this is what you're typically, typically going to see. So we'll come up here to Email, and it's going through that process of installing Outlook and configuring it for uh, Frank Bullhead in this case. So this is just a locally significant configuration. If Frank went to a different computer in the organization, this exact same thing would be taking place, and you have to go through this setup all over again. So I click Next here. Yes, I want to set up an email account. This time we're selecting Microsoft Exchange Server. Okay, and we just have to specify the machine once again that we're connecting to. So your users typically won't know this information. You'd have to supply this for them. Um, either type it in, do it yourself, or give them some sort of memo to get this info. Okay, so now I just click Next and Finish, and now you see that uh, Frank Bullhead now has Outlook set up for him as well. Okay, so I'm just going to do a quick change here for our reading pane, and you can see that test message from Bob Bass has already come through. Okay, so fairly simple to configure Outlook and get it set up on a local network uh, to be sending email back and forth. Not too difficult at all. Okay, that wraps up Video 3 Part 1. We'll see you back here real soon when we get into Video 3 Part 2 and finish out our series on configuring Outlook 2003.